young man. Listen, I want to thank you for taking the time. One thing I'm going to simply say, Jimmy, is that you are a guy of tenure. You've done an awful lot. So I want you to tell everybody here a little bit about yourself. All right, well, I started in the drag race industry back in the 80s. Worked in the back door Napa store, learned how to disassemble motors and clean them up and went from there. And uh, finally moved up here, had my own shop in Birmingham, moved up here in 98 and went to work for a Bush Grand National team as a, in the engine shop as a, an engine assembler, engine machinist, whatever. And I've since gone through Chip Ganassi and uh, retired from Robert Yates. And so now I have a little shop here that I do my own thing since I'm retired, okay. which I haven't had a day off since I retired, but that's okay. Got to stay busy. Yeah. Well, it's, it's obviously uh, part of your DNA. You love this stuff. Now, you know, with the diversity of all your products, all the different engine you know, from top fuel to uh, the smallest engine you've ever built, inline four cylinders, V8s, uh, normally aspirated, power boosted, supercharged. Uh, there's a common thread in engine. Now, I can't go into all the things that you know, and, and like I say, you, again, are one of those guys that I've forgotten more than I know. But here's one question I have. The common thing about all engines, cranks go round and round, pistons go up and down. Now, in order for that to be efficient, now we have bearings and we have clearances and we have all these things that you take care of in the assembly. But what about balance? How does that play into you? Well, the balance gives it longevity. Okay. It, it'll run for a length of time, whether it's balanced or not. But the parts are going to the parts are going to fatigue, and you know, it's just like on a million mile diesel motor. The hone has to be right. The balance has to be right. Everything has to be correct for it to last that time. So you're adding longevity by balancing. Now, four cylinders, that's a different story. They're sure. going to have a vibration in them at some point in the range. Mm -hmm. By balancing the four cylinder, you move the vibration out of your power range. Okay. and put it down where it doesn't matter as much. But okay. when it's at running at peak song and for, for a race motor, for instance, the 24 hours of Daytona, that thing's got to run 24 hours. It better be smooth at the horsepower reading where you want to run it. If you're going to run it at 7,400 RPM for 24 hours, it better be smooth there or it ain't going to stay together. That four-cylinder will machine... It will machine the U-joints out. It will machine the clutch hub out. It will machine everything just like you put it in a lathe and cut it out. So you have a race car lathe is what you're saying? Yes. Okay. Yes. Well, uh, you know, there's all sorts of different theories, uh, overbounds, underbounds, and we accept the fact that people have, especially engine builders, they do come up with what they consider their recipe that's optimal. And the way you get the recipe you, you don't get it from your drag racer that you see their mo motor once a year. Okay. You, you don't get it from your boat guy that's out with his family. You get it from the engines that you tear down every week. All right. And that engine, if you pay attention, will tell you what it wants. But you have to look at it every time. I mean, a top fuel engine, you tear it down every run. Mm -hmm. You can look and tell. You can actually tune by how much it crushes the bearings or whatever. Uh, the the stock car engines, you can tell if it's burning the push rods up. You can tell if it's out of balance if the bearing's fretting in the rod. If it wants a little overbalance or if it wants a little underbalance, it'll tell you by the way the bearings are moving in the surfaces. And you can, if you look at it every week, and you find this is wrong with it, and you work on that problem, and next week that problem's better, you know you move the right direction. Sometimes you move the wrong direction. 50, yeah. there, there's, not a, there, there's not a one size fits all for anything. And there's not a, a drag race motor's not the same as a round track motor, and a round track motor's not the same as a street motor. It just don't work that way. They all take different clearances and different specs but the balance is the most critical to making longevity 
So basically, though, whenever we do this kind of interpretation of how to handle things, the bearing is the go-to area, right? I would think so. Yeah. Y yes. That's and, the scene uh, of the crime, right? Right. And if you look at the bearings every week and you adjust your balance up or down, when you get the bearings look like they come out of the box after 500 miles, you're pretty close, whether it's balance or clearance or, or a certain type of oil. Sure. But it's all works together in conjunction. Well, one of the things there is, again, a lot of our work covers a vast array of engine application and racing, you know, drag racing. You know, I always joke about it that if you took a season of racing, they didn't have an hour on the engine. Right. Right. And then, of course, I go to a road race course. That's, uh, let's, let's do a 24-hour in Daytona. That's 24 hours. Yes. Okay. So this thing is just constantly, constantly just wearing it. I always use the term, a little baby with a little hammer un unattended can destroy anything. Right. So it's a matter of this little bit of energy that's pragmatic, won't release, can't change. It's not like you change a spark plug and clean up a cylinder or change an injector or something like that. Balancing is forever. Do we agree? Balancing is forever. And the only thing that, the, the worst thing that can happen is you lose a cylinder in a motor because then you've got fire impulses that are out of balance. There you go. And that's why you have a harmonic dampener and stuff on it to take care of that stuff that you can't do that's on the it. balance machine. Absolutely. That's an excellent part. In other words, this part right here in this machine, or any machine, let's be fair about it, can only do what's called first order balance. Right. But every 90 degrees on a V8, we get a power stroke. All right. So what we have is four cycles plus the first cycle. Now, one of the things we do want to do in, in balancing is we'll notice on this particular crank, this is the counterweight at the moment is straight up, and you notice the rear is straight down. If I was to draw a line from this tip to this tip, ideally it would go right through dead center at the main. Well, that's what this optimum balance situation is. We want whatever energy is here, I'll just use 10 grams and 10 grams, or let's make it 100 and 100. If it goes straight through, it's zero right here, all right? Now, unfortunately, we'll see situations where this one may be here, that's where the load moment is, and then this guy is here. In other words, we're not canceling, all right? That's called coupling. If you can't couple, then instead of having one pulse, you'll end up with three pulse. Now, the problem with that is as we decrease the magnitude, that is the amount of energy. But however, I'm back from big hammer to little hammer. Right. Now I got three hammers on one rotation, plus the four power strokes. So you can understand the kind of sort of like you are balancing. You're going to sit there. Oops, excuse me. We're going to try and get these at the end in opposites. Agreed? Yes. Last thing we're going to do, though, is we're going to try and set a standard for this. Now, we have a calculator that's set up, and it's based on the ISO, just for a point of reference. It's called 21940. In the past, GM Motors, Ford, Chrysler, all of them, their OEM work, they had a generic tolerance of two ounce inch. Now to throw that real quick, because depending upon the counterweight, that's somewhere around 20 plus grams. And this was A-OK -okay for down the road. Uh, this is not your father's Oldsmobile. This is a different gig. So now we can go in here, because this is an international calculator, so we know this cumulative with the harmonic balance and so forth is somewhere right around, what, 65? I think we said 65, 65 pounds. 65 pounds. All right, so we'll enter that. Now, what service speed are you going to run here? We're going to run about 8,000 with this motor. All right, so let's do that. Now, we're going to do ounce inch. That's telling us we want to be 0 0.154 ounce inch. That's a little confusing at times. So what I want to know is what's the radius here? What do we have in the Three and a half inches. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to import that right there, I'm going to do it here, and it's now going to tell me at that counterweight I want to have 1.247 grams. So I've taken this number and basically converted it so I have a better understanding of what's residual to the crank. Notice that's not 20 grams, that's what it used to be. This is what stock, by the way, General Motors, Ford, Chrysler, all the new engines, they had to lower it because they lightened the block, which, by the way, the block is a damp device. It will take vibrations and pull it down. Or sequester, not quite, but just damp. Now, the deal is, is that because it's so light, they started having deals where they've learned if lean is mean, 
All right, the, the electronic control system now have made the unit so that, quite frankly, uh, it's so lean it's getting a little combustion knock. All right, so they have accelerometers on the block, and as soon as they see that, it says I'm lean. So it fattens the motor up, right? Okay. What they found was, in order to have that have validity, this was contaminating that. In other words, that amount of 20 grams was generating just enough force to give a false trigger to the accelerometers. Okay? Okay. So this is why the OEs now are <laughs> balancing at race standards. Remember, I think we used to use a generic term of 0.2 ounce inch for racing, right? What's that one? 0.15. This is grandma's car. This is what's changed, and this is where technology has a benefit with a penalty. So when we balance even stock stuff, and this is why when you get these crank kits and you're buying, and I'm not belittling any of the crank manufacturers, I'm simply saying they generically set a bob weight, and they'll have, say, plus or minus 2% of your bob weight. Well, if you're an 1800 bob weight, 2% is 36 grams. Yeah. Swing. So there's no way that unit's going to be in tolerance for late model engines. Do you agree with that? Yeah, that, I mean, that's, that's way more than 3% uh, overbalanced on a 1,600-gram on a bob weight. Exactly. And that's just reciprocating weight. That's not rotating weight. See, we're at an era in engine building now. Guessing doesn't work. No. If you can't measure, it has no net. In other words, you're, you're screwed, bottom line. We're now at a, a, a level of industry. We have technology and hardware that can give us accurate data. So I'm just going to go ahead and accept that tolerance. And you see it embedded right here. And I'm going to save that. Now, what it did is it saved to the library. So if you watch your arm there, I'm going to go ahead and spin it. Now, what we're doing is we're collecting an awful lot of data, more than any other machine on the market. But we're getting 40 spins on this side collected, 40 spins on this side collected, and then that's done. The algorithm sits there and argues. I want to see what's going on. When it does it, it'll stop, and now it's going to come up and say on the left side, you're 36 grams out. Right side, you're 48 grams. And all I'm going to do here is just come around and bring it up to top dead center. Now, in doing so, what's the problem? It's it needs weight. It needs Mallory in it. Okay. It doesn't have enough counterweight on it. Exactly. So I'm going to keep this simple. We used to sit there and do a lot of mental gymnastics to figure this out. I'm just going to change this. And you notice the needle flipped. The screen changed. and saying, you're not going to drill here. You're in the add mode. So I'm going to bring you up. Now you can see i got to <laughs> add weight. All right? Same thing will hold true on the other side. But we're still not there. So we have another little trick here. We're going to go in, and we're going to sit there, and we're going to take the crank and just let it know the counterweight. This is an important factor because not all counterweights are in the same position. Different manufacturers, and I'll, I'll use this generously, and I'll say sometimes they have a sense of humor, and they guess. I don't like guessing. So rather than assume, I'm just going to mark. I'm going to go to the other side here, mark. And what it's done is it's given me a suggestion and I want to now know what the material is. But first, I need to know this is 0.888. I'm going to let it know. And I'm going to say, see that red light? Is it up? Not there. Now, again, it's procedurally stepping you through. So I'm just going to go up here, and I'm going to increase the diameter. Now you can see it's green, or 7.11 grams. That's what we need to install right here on the side. And then we'll be approximately seven grams heavy so exactly. we can massage the counterweight. That's right. So can you drill that out? Yeah, that might be one way. A lot of times people are a little more artistic. They'll take a grinder. And we, we don't like holes in cranks, by the way. Right. Okay. But yet, you see that big old drill mechanism? That's rather unique to the industry. That bad boy will make things happen. However, I will tell you as a connoisseur of balancing, and you're the guy that needs to talk about this, what happens when we drill holes in counterweights? Well, it creates windage. Yeah. So you're better off if you can turn the counterweights. You're much better off to turn the counterweights, especially in a racing application. We drill holes because it's easy. But there's a penalty for that. There's a penalty by the aeration in the oil and the windage in the oil pan. So how about Grandma's car? What if we just drill her? She's not going to be 8,000. No. I mean, 
Grandma? Unless you're, I guess unless, remember the old drag on lady, the drag racer? I mean, she might be the exception. <laughs> uh, I mean, we drill a lot of counterweights. Okay. But they're, but they're relatively low RPM motors. And, and we do turn counterweights and still drill holes, but we try to keep it to a drill point. Right. Rather than a long hole. Well, interesting enough, as you drill that, you now take the, the benefit of the counterweight, which has multiple purposes, not just for balance. It also adds strength to the crank. It also acts as a damper, believe it or not, because that mass is harder to push, so it dampens some of the torsion out. But the bottom line is you can go over center and create a whole new problem, especially in racing, that it, it, all of a sudden the bearing's mad. Right? All of a sudden everything, even if, all the way up to the valve train's mad. Right, because that crank doesn't just have unbalance, it's no, no longer structurally supportive, it's wiggling, right? So at any rate, on this particular one, let's do it real quick on this guy. Again, I'm gonna set it up, align it, let it know. We'll go to the other side here real quick. And we're going to do this, and I'm gonna go back in and size it. And you notice it went red, so it said, okay, give me an opportunity to fix that. Now this one's 12 grams over, 7 grams. But you now have a target register that you'll set up in your machine here. You'll drill and ring, put it back on. It's going to be real close to these numbers, assuming you did what it said, not what you want. Now, Got you, a, the one thing about computers, they don't lie. No, and if you don't give them the right information, they'll, they will tell you the answer but it won't be the right one. You have to put the right information in. Exactly. So, in a nutshell, this is technology to last summer. You have tenured your industry, or in this industry, for a number of years. Is this the way that grandma used to do it, or grandpa? Absolutely not. So what does it really say? We, what we used to have to do was clamp metal, a metal weight in here and move it around until we got it as good as we could right. and then try to replicate that. Right. Guessing. And, and, and we still got those pieces. And, you know, we still have metal slugs to go in here. Never put Mallory in in this direction. Why not? It'll fly out. Oh, <laughs> that, that, okay. But, I mean, if you want to put a steel plug in here and weld it in, that's fine. But don't put Mallory in in that direction. Now, isn't that because of the disparity of alloys, no density? Actually, you... When you, when you weld it in, you're actually not welding to the Mallory. There's two dissimilar metals. What you gotta do is you gotta build a dam wall there to hold it in, which you would never put it in that way. But if you put a steel slug in there that's compatible with the crank, you can physically weld the two pieces together. Sure. Welding 101, only weld similar materials, not dissimilar. Right. Well, I mean, they make stuff for dissimilar, but not to hold, mal hold it in there. And also remember the reason we're doing this. Common sense says if it's going through the side, right, it ain't coming out. Right. All right. However, what happens when they drill them too big and then they slip them in there and they weld it, that Mallory into the crank? You're not welding to the Mallory. There you go. You're, you're, you're putting a daub of something on there? You're, what? I've had to do it. And I turn a taper on the crank and a taper on the mallory. And I fill the taper up because the weld will stick to the crank. Well, now you've got a limit to keep that mallory in there. It's not welded to the mallory. You're building a dam where it can't come out. Now, I have seen people, and I haven't done it, but I have seen people put a piece of mallory in here. And to weld it in, you're wasting your time. But I've also seen them... When they had to put a piece in here because of lack of counterweight, you go back and drill it and pin it. To hold, to grab it. To hold, to hold it. Yeah. But you have to pin it all the way through the mallory and the crank, and you have to be low enough that it don't tear it out. Right. Because if that piece comes out of there, we had a piece come out, it'll knock a side out of the block, it'll knock a starter off, and it'll kill somebody if it hits them. Well, that's a good point because of the service speed. Let's go ahead and put it up at 10,000 RPM. Let's say we're about this radius right here. Everybody sort of has an idea what a nine millimeter bullet is. That's bigger than nine millimeter. You agree? That, that's that's more like a twelve gauge slug. There you go, and it's going to leave a mark that you're not going to like. No. Okay. 
So safety is always a concern. And by the way, the technician that puts that in, I, uh, my daughter's a lawyer, in fact, she's a judge now, and she'll tell you, you'll lose that court and case. More importantly, that's one thing to lose money, it's another thing to cause injury. Common sense says, don't do that. Yeah. Fair enough? Do not do that. All right, so now we've looked at this, we found out a quick remedy, but you sort of jumped ahead because you already had the bobweights on here. Now we have to build the bobweights based on pistons, rods, rings, bearings, uh, clip, pins, whatever the case is. Now you've already done that and you put this up and you've already populated this up here for us. And so you've had the advantage of knowing what the bob weight. So, all right, this is all pretty easy stuff, no worries. But the number one thing in building anything is accuracy, you agree? Primary. Correct. All right, second thing of concern is what? Time? Yes, out, time is money. Yeah, I check on that, it's 24 seven. There is no 28 five, no. nothing. I mean, it's just, no. it's, that's all there is. So when we do this, You've been doing this long enough. Where are you at with this kind of technology as opposed to what you used to do? Well, used to, you, I mean, populating the bob weight card is great because, one, it'll tell you if you're wrong. Right. Uh, which, if you do it with a pen and paper like we used to do it with a calculator, you better check it twice. Yeah. And you better check this twice, too. Yeah. But, I mean, you take a whole brand new rotating assembly. You go through this particular machine here, and you can weigh all eight rods, big end and total weight. It'll mm -hmm. give you the little end weight times eight. That's already in there. Right. And then you can go weigh every wrist pin and every piston and weigh your rings and your locks. And if you want to, this will sort this so that if you're a couple of grams over uh, with a tolerance in there, if you have a couple of grams either way, you put a tolerance in there, and it'll tell you whether you're green or you're red. I'm going to tighten the tolerance a little bit there. Now you see it fell out. Right. Okay. And, and sorting it will take your heavy and your light, and you match them together. It'll help you straighten this out without doing a bunch of machine work on the rods or a bunch of machine work on a piston. Because so you go drilling a hole with a piston, you're structurally changing the strength of that piston. And grinding on the rod, you're gonna make, if you grind enough on the bottom end of the rod, anytime you remove weight or remove metal off this rod, it's stress relieving. And it's gonna make this hole out of round. Yep. When you untorque it and torque it back up, it's not gonna be what it was. And you're gonna to have to go back and rehone it to make it round. Well, let me, one of the things, now YouTube is sort of an interesting vehicle of knowledge. It's also an interesting vehicle of humor, and is also dangerous input. All right, notice I'll save that for the last. In the days of old, when we made rods, we had weight pads. Yes. These are now called near shape. Now, the manufacturing developments that we had over here do a pretty good job. That's why we're looking here. But you cannot, under any circumstance, modify this and make it stronger. No. Can't even be the same. No, you can't. It'll be weaker. It's going to be weaker. You're going to take material off of these ribs, which is the strengthening of the cap, not to mention you're stress relieving that metal, and it's going to make this hole out of round. Well, so penalty, penalty, penalty. Yes. Okay. On the Internet, I'm seeing a lot of guys, well-intended people, come out and talk about this, and they, these are gentlemen, that are, they believe in themselves, and they say, well, we can go up and whisper this a little bit. All right, or, and this is the worst one, right here. Get on this end. A lot of people, this rod is designed for what? Load in which direction? It's, it's in, uh, not tension, but. Right, anyway. so when we, then every engine goes in compression and then overlap, right? Yes. And we're in overlap, what is the piston trying to do? The pit, piston's trying to pull off the end of the rod. That's it, right. It'll open the pin end up. So let's do this. Which end do you think stronger? I, if I had to do something, you can see as I weaken this, there's more of a chance of separation. Most engine failures, I think we can agree with this, the majority of it is in an overlap event where that's where we'll have the piston and rod separate. Generally, if you lose a bearing or something in the motor, it'll stay together until you lift off the throttle. Right. There you go. So here's, that's just a little tidbit of industry, but as we go through these things, here's where I'm at. We've done all this in just a few minutes. 
We've got a complete diagnosis. We have remedy. We have resources to check everything. We are sending out a better product now because of technology. Fair enough? Absolutely. Okay. And then you keyed on the last thing, time. Time is what? Time is money. There you go. So investment, you know, we just, we've been very fortunate to trip out here with Keith Thornton. We're talking to Jason Lyon, talking to you also. Every one of you has a common thread, and that is simply quality, quality, quality. None of you are talking to me about price. In fact, if I try to talk to you about cheaper stuff, red flag, red flag, red flag. Fair enough? Fair enough. All right, so if you were to sit there and say, well, here again, your, what's the name of your company now again? Uh, Custom Performance Engines. Located? In uh, Mooresville, North Carolina. All right. So people in this area, they are looking for people of your caliper to come in and do work. That's a little bit of a promo for you, but you, you earned it. <laughs> uh, so if you were to sit there and a guy says, well, I really don't need to balance my engine, but I bought all these things from a reputable builder, what would you tell him? Tell him that I wasn't going to, if he wanted me to assemble it, I wouldn't do it without balancing it. Right. I mean, that's because you're guessing, right? You wouldn't know. Wouldn't know. Guessing is? Couldn't sleep at night. Okay, there you go. All right, well, listen, is there any final comment that you can think of about balancing you think is interested in our viewers? Well, I mean, you can't do without it. I mean, if, unless, I mean, I've checked a lot of, production automotive engines. And I had one the other day that was an LS7 Corvette motor that we weighed all the parts and put it up here and the crank was perfect. Well, that's not a real world situation most of the time. But that one was. But that's one in about a hundred. Well, you know, you triggered a thought here real quick. I know we gotta finish up, but what about when guys change flywheels? Well, the flywheel is just like anything else, especially if it's a counterweighted flywheel. Man, you're in a whole nother world there. And it's just like when you change a clutch and a pressure plate. That pressure plate, if that hole in that flywheel is not exactly centered and it moves that pressure plate even 10 thousandths off center, that needs to be rebalanced and it needs to be marked to the flywheel where it goes on in the same orientation or it's not balanced. Well, once again, I think we, we know this now in discussion, but a lot of people don't understand that simple error. And I think you told me once about a Ford issue or you had a flywheel change. Oh, yes. I had a, we had a tow truck one time uh, that we pulled the ARCA car with, and we had a 429 Cleveland motor in it, and we got a 460. Well, the 460 is external balance. The 429 we had wasn't. And I mistakenly put the flex plate on the 460 and it about shook the mirrors off the truck. And it was only like 30 or 40 grams, but it was a long way out there. So even a guy of your caliber, knowing what you know, are suspect to, well, you, you went through a learning curve. Well, we made a mistake yeah. and it taught us we needed to correct it. Right away. Yeah, yes, because we, you know, it was just, uh, I actually built the motor and we actually balanced the crank with the correct flywheel and it just got the wrong one in the truck. So it was easy to fix, but it taught us that we needed to fix it. Well, so assuming is a bad thing? Assuming is always a bad thing. Okay, fair enough. Well, listen, I want to thank you for your time. You've been a great friend and help. And, uh, Good luck to your business. Yes, sir. What a day, what a day, what a day. Uh, yeah, my, brain, my brain is swollen. I've learned so much today. He told us, don't start cars. We are not going to listen.